This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. As we all acknowledge, climate change is a complex challenge, and its solutions require commitment from and collaboration with a variety of stakeholders, including government, academics, philanthropists, nonprofit organizations, the business community, and religious leaders. Um, it is encouraging and, frankly, not surprising uh, that as the University of California ramped up its sustainability actions in the past two years, so too was the state of California in pursuit of achieving ambitious sustainability goals under the leadership of Governor Jerry Brown. I think as citizens of California, we are fortunate to have a governor who understands the immediate critical threat of climate change. He has moved beyond the rhetoric that dominates public discourse to real action. He's put his full support behind aggressive steps that have made California a leader in combating climate change and reducing our collective carbon footprint. Governor Brown has called for the state's reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2030. This is the most ambitious carbon goal adopted by any North American government, government for that time frame. The governor, the governor has also pledged to increase the amount of energy California derives from renewable sources, increase the efficiency of existing buildings, and make heating fuels cleaner. He has called for California to reduce the release of methane, black carbon, and other potent pollutants across industries. And he supported management practices that ensure farms, rangelands, forests, and wetlands can store carbon. Um, as the state's higher education research arm, UC serves as a living laboratory for California. The university's discoveries, its educational mission, and its operational reforms complement and support many of the strategies that the state has implemented. This summit further cements our shared vision and goals and transforms the work of our university into solutions for our state and for beyond. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the governor of California, Jerry Brown. Thank you very much, uh, particularly uh, President Napolitano. This is a very uh, significant gathering in a very significant place. Uh, California has been in the forefront of dealing with uh, uh, airborne pollutants and uh, more recently climate change, and the university has been at the heart of all that. So I can't uh, emphasize enough how important the contribution of the University of California is to dealing with this existential threat of climate change. I don't know if there's any other university in the world that has brought together its scientists, its leaders from all its uh, different branches to focus on this very topical uh, but very difficult challenge uh, called climate change. And we've got a long way to go. And we've got a lot of obstacles. But with the University of California in the forefront uh, and the state of California uh, leading with very concrete actions, uh, I think th there's a great deal that we can, we can accomplish. And I would say it's absolutely indispensable to deal with climate change that California continues on the path that it's on. Because there's a lot of people out there who are not on this path. Uh, just this week, uh, 26 states 
have joined in a lawsuit to uh, invalidate President Obama's uh, Clean Air Act initiative to curb uh, pollution, particularly from coal plants. Uh, so here we are, instead of moving forward, we're moving backward. And we just noticed from the recent surveys that the number one leading candidate on the Republican Party, Dr. Carson, uh, has said that there is no research about climate change or showing it. And I sent him a um, one of those little things with all the, what do you call those little discs with all the, all the IPCC research. I sent him that and said, go read it, because it's all there. Um, I don't know if he ever did. Uh, I hope he does. And a lot of the papers are from University of California and from other universities, Stanford in particular, um, and others. So I saw a paper just mentioned uh, this morning in the paper from Loyola Marymount. And it, it just almost daily, uh, papers are coming out uh, illustrating uh, the, all the different uh, aspects of the changing climate. And so what we're, we're engaged here is not just another uh, scientific discussion. This has real world applications. Uh, and California, you see, is particularly situated, um, not just because of its research prowess, but because its history of managing the three and national laboratories uh, and participating in the Manhattan Project, which at that time uh, faced the uh, existential threat of fascism and overcoming it in World War II. So that's a good uh, predicate to now deal with the existential threat of climate change. Now, climate change uh, doesn't have a, a face. It doesn't have a national identity. And it's not located in any one spot. It's diffuse, it's global, and that makes it uh, difficult. What's so amazing is uh, the, the um, intensity of the opposition. Uh, it, it's uh, really hard to believe. I, I don't know if you watched that debate, uh, the CNN debate. I watched it very carefully. There was one question uh, on climate change, and that was uh, quoting, uh, it was from Secretary Schultz about the Reagan approach and the Reagan approach was, why not take out an insurance policy? And that was with regret to the fluorocarbons, the Montreal uh, Protocol. And it was kind of a simple uh, notion. Um, you know there's a risk. <clears throat> you people might, uh, people are gonna debate about the exact nature of the risk, but it's, it's there, and there's the possibility of real catastrophe. So why not uh, take out an insurance policy and that meaning take steps to invest in reducing carbon pollution. Uh, but of course, there was a, no answer. Well, there was a couple answers. One answer is uh, all the, first of all, the effort at dealing with climate change is a left-wing movement. That was the first point. Uh, the second point was that any action that this left-wing movement suggests will destroy jobs. Well, California, again, is positioned to refute that. Uh, California is growing faster than the national average. And now compared with um, our friends from Texas, whose economy is slowing based on the instability and, and drop in the price of oil. And that's something that I think we have to keep in mind. California imports 70% of the oil it, it consumes. 70% of oil is foreign in one way or another. But 100% of the sun is local. It's all here. <laughs> So it's just a matter of time, and we're getting closer. The price drop in photovoltaics is incredible. In fact, I remember uh, in my campaign for governor five years ago, uh, in talking with some of my environmental advisors, we were discussing, well, let's propose a plan, and a certain amount will be photovoltaic, a certain amount will be central-based solar, the large uh, solar that you see in the desert. And um, at that time, some people were saying photovoltaic is going to be the technology that uh, uh, becomes more and more economical, and therefore it'll be the one of choice. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, but that was not something that was obvious six years ago. And so in that short of space of time, uh, the technology has advanced. 
and oh. that makes all the difference. And now we're faced, of course, with uh, the same challenge with batteries. Can a battery, can battery technology advance to the point where it's cheaper, more efficient, uh, lighter weight? So uh, truly, the electric car can outcompete, even without subsidies, the combustion engine. And I was just discussing this, um, actually, this weekend at my wife's Stanford reunion. She's the class of 1980, only 20 years after me. Uh, but in any event, <laughs> I s w sat there and I, I met, ran into one of the foremost um, entrepreneurs and venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Uh, and he said he thought in the next few years, uh, the electric car will uh, be in a position to displace the uh, combustion engine. I said, well, five years? He said, well, could be. So maybe it's 10 years, but it's not 50 years. So it's, there's real-time disruption going on. And uh, that, I think, is good news. And California has been at the forefront. And in that respect, I think it's good to note the necessity of perseverance and keeping at it. Because we're here uh, in California in this advanced position, uh, not just because of, of one political party or one governor. Uh, we can go all the way back to the governorship of, of Ronald Reagan uh, when uh, the Clean Air Act was so amended as to allow California to have its own emission standards. That's where it began. Um, in the Clean Air Act at that time, and ever since, California has been pioneering stricter emission standards on vehicles. And then uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger signed the Global uh, Warming Solutions Act, uh, a major effort. Before that, Gray Davis had signed the uh, Pavley Bill, which um, uh, controlled uh, tail emissions. And of course, the whole thing was held up until the Supreme Court, by one vote, five to four, uh, Massachusetts versus the EPA said yes, uh, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases uh, could be considered under the Clean Air Act a pollutant. And now that was a, could have gone the other way, and we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are. Same is true today. Uh, similarly, with the uh, uh, Clean Air uh, Clean Air Act uh, regulations proposed by President Obama, they're making the same move, try to say, well, it doesn't cover it. And we'll find out. I think the Supreme Court will do as they did before and uphold that. But it just illustrates uh, what a battle we're at. Even in California, we had a discussion, uh, should we try to reduce oil by 50 percent? And um, a surprising number of legislators thought that was um, too far out, was, was going to cost jobs. Just the other way around. Climate change is going to cost jobs. In fact, another report just uh, it's in the, on the internet, as I was scanning that on the way down, saying that uh, by the end of the century, the economy would be 23 percent lower uh, because of, uh, of climate change and global warming. So when we compare costs, we have to compare it against what? You know, against yesterday? No. Against the inevitable uh, trend of where we're going. And if we let the climate get above two or three or four, which once you start with all the tipping points, you can't guarantee you're going to keep it at two. Because once it, it the, all these different uh, nonlinear uh, transactions occur, it's very hard to tell where you are. And just taking a reasonable calculation, and then you put a number on that. Uh, Nicholas Stern, in his book, What Are We Waiting For?, uh, examined these uh, climate models and said none of them, none of them uh, calculate a world beyond two degrees, above two degrees. So that means that if the climate is going above two, let's just say three, there is no climate model that says what the cost of that is. If you don't know what the cost of that is, you don't know what the cost benefit uh, calculation is. So from uh, a lot of evidence, uh, reducing climate change is actually free. You're going to save money. You're going to save money if you have a longer-term horizon. And that's the only kind of horizon you should be thinking of. And that's where California and UC come in and where this uh, conference becomes very important. Uh, we are up against very powerful opposition, uh, partisan, uh, industrial, um, and um, uh, media. 
Uh, there's a lot out there that is doubting, saying, don't worry, uh, don't, uh, all manner of obfuscation. And uh, the, the challenge is to be clear, to be convincing, and to be consistent, and to grow and spread uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world. And I think this bending the curve, I mean, this is pretty amazing, because I think in general, I, I don't always understand the academic world, but I understand the academic world likes to be a non-partisan or non-active or non in the, in the fray, just the pure research of finding out what the truth is and what the knowledge that comes out of this research is. But in this bending the curve, if you look at the 10 recommendations, this is a call to, uh, to activism, to action. And if we put all our best minds together in California, uh, with the research integrity and capacity of the University of California. That is a very formidable force, and nothing less than that is required. It's very difficult to imagine something into the future, and it's very hard to imagine something that uh, is beyond our, our, our the normal or the conventional. Uh, nobody, I don't believe, when those well-educated mostly classically trained leaders in uh, Great Britain and France and uh, Russia and Germany around 1913 and 1914. I don't think they were calculating all the consequences when they all marched off with the bands to war in August of 1914. And they were all smart. They were all good, religiously trained individuals. Many of them had studied Latin and Greek. These were real elites. But they really screwed things up. World War I was the worst war to date, and it paved the way from everything that followed in terms of fascism and the rise of Nazism in Germany. And we still, in the Middle East, are uh, feeling the repercussions of that very dumb, uh, catastrophic war. So what was needed then and what didn't occur was imagination, to think through uh, what, what could be and therefore uh, judge accordingly. So now, looking forward to climate change, if we stay on the current uh, fossil fuel-based economy, which has got us to where we are, and we always think whatever got us here is going to keep getting us to the next place. Nope. We've got to get off fossil fuel. We've got to decarbonize. And that takes an imagination. Can we imagine a world not based on carbon in the way this world is based? And that's, that's the big challenge. Now, in California, uh, we are taking steps, as I'm sure has been talked about. Uh, we're take, we have the cap and trade. We have the low carbon fuel standard. That's the standard the oil companies love to hate most. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the very bill in, in California that, where they took out the 50 percent, um, we had to take out the 50 percent reduction in oil by 2030, we could have had it in. We could have identified did one thing, get rid of the low carbon fuel standard. And in Washington, where um, the governor faced a hostile state senate, the price of investing in a major road program was his uh, elimination of a low carbon fuel standard. But that's not going to stop us. California has a low carbon fuel standard. Oregon, despite pressure, has a low carbon fuel standard. So does British Columbia. And we have to keep spreading that. Now, it's not to say we know how uh, to get all the biofuels that we need or that we, can, we know exactly how we're going to get to low carbon fuel um, standard, which, by the way, is a 10 percent low carbon fuel on our tr trucks and cars uh, by 2020. But we're moving in that direction. And that's where research comes in, development, investment. We, we need that, that effort, that political will uh, based on an imagined, uh, how we imagine the future. It can be much better. And there is what it is. And it's contributing. All the things that the skeptics say are bad, California is doing. And the results show they're good. We have. <laughs> By the way, in talking about reducing our use of oil, uh, the, the experts are telling us that we have to, uh, the uh, panel on, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change says we've got to leave 40 percent of the oil in the ground. Of the known reserves, not the unknown, the known reserves, 40 percent have to stay in the ground. Uh, the uh, uh, 
um, Mark Carney, the um, uh, managing director of the Bank of England, said that by the time people figure out what we, what we have to keep in the ground, there'll be stranded assets. And the oil-stranded assets will devastate the financial system. So as a banker, he's making the point that with the oil companies blind to what they have to do, they're going to create a financial catastrophe when their companies quickly lose the value that the coal companies. Coal companies have lost 90 percent of their market cap. That's pretty serious. And when I was at, in Los Angeles last month to, um, uh, uh, at the opening of this clean cars, a uh, whole series of, of uh, EV, electric uh, vehicle cars, um, the head of the Edison Institute, relatively conservative organization, the lobbying arm of all the utilities in the United States, said that what happened to coal is going to happen to oil. And of course, the electric utilities are only too glad to substitute um, electricity um, for, for sun, I mean, for, uh, for oil. And that is really, when you think about it, when we have promoted more efficient buildings and more efficient cars, then where are the electric, where are the electric companies going to get their customers? Well, they're going to get their customers because California is going to have four or five million electric cars by 2030, because that's the only way we can meet our, our goal, our 2030 goals. So there's an ally. And by the way, talking about electric utilities, it was only a few years ago when the electric utilities said they cannot get to 20% uh, renewable energy. Can't get there by 2020. Well, they're already in San Diego. The electric utility is at 30 percent, and they said they're going to go at 33 percent, and they're going to 40 percent by sometime in 2017. So that shows you the power uh, of imagination, of technological uh, prowess, which we have in this state. And so that is what I believe this conference, it, it, we know what it's all about. We want to bend the curve. We bend the curve with our brains, uh, with our collective action, uh, and all the other ways that a great uh, civilization and society uh, prospers instead of uh, falls back. And we know everybody falls back at some point, but this climate change uh, is really, uh, it's a fork in the road. Are we going to take a path that is more difficult, less traveled by, or are we just going to go along with the obvious conventional wisdom? And California has always been the great exception. A lot of these conservative commentators talk about America uh, as the great, as the, uh, the exceptionality. Well, as a matter of fact, the whole notion of being exceptional uh, was, the, when I heard about it, Kerry McWilliams, a rather left-wing uh, journalist, in 1948 wrote a book about California, and it was called California, The Great Exception. And we are the great exception in a very, very positive way by our uh, foresightedness, by our consensus in getting stuff done, and by uh, our sensitivity uh, to climate change. And I know as a, as a person in politics, uh, it's difficult to do, deal with something that's so diffuse. One of the objections by the Republicans were, America's not a planet, so we can't do anything. Well, as a matter of fact, while California is not a planet, it's still a global leader. And what we do will be disseminated, will spread. Uh, the exemplary uh, power of everything we do works for us, but it will work for everyone else. And so that is really um, what our, our challenge is. Do what we're doing. Uh, realize that in politics, um, football is more exciting than dealing with climate change. <laughs> I want to acknowledge that. Uh, all the other goodies and stuff that make our life what it is, uh, that's the real stuff. You know, jobs and income and, and getting all the stuff. But uh, leaders don't just go along with what is obvious. Leaders are able to see over the horizon to uh, what's in store for us. And so in that sense, California has had a long tradition of imagination and leadership and looking over the horizon. And this conference, in all its efforts, and its 10 points, which, by the way, will be enough to keep me working for long after my <laughs> short remaining term. So thank you very much. And Janet, thank you. This is really big. And I join with you 100%.